Well, we lived in University City, which is where the epidemic occurred. And uh, I think the, uh, it was, uh, it seemed to come on as a, a thunderstorm with a teenage girl coming to our emergency room in shock with no pulses below the waist. Uh, and uh, Demetis uh, in BUN was 90. She was our babysitter, uh, which was uh, unsettling. Peggy was in terms of her condition. And when I saw her in the emergency room, we were doing a lot of things to try to get her out of shock. And uh, the uh, so she had multiple organ failures. She had the uh, Wheels disease version of leptospirosis. Uh, there's a lot of serotypes of uh, leptospira, but the uh, what uh, and the disease varies from self-limited flu-like illness to uh, death, and uh, and the most severe next to death would be what would be Wheels disease. It's, it's not caused by a specific leptospira; it can be caused by any. This one was uh, autonalis, if I remember right. Maybe it was hemorrhagic, but I think it was autonalis. The uh, it's in the it's in the paper in the uh, Journal of Clinical Investigation with uh, Louis Loeb's L O B E S, who was a young guy from the CDC that helped us work it out. Ralph's name is on that one, and Bonnie Anderson's. And so we. Uh, once we were sensitized to the fact that it was in our environment, we started to make the diagnosis in kids that were sick, uh, not as sick as uh, Peggy, but one kid who lost part of his buttocks uh, from the thrombotic process. And, uh, actually, Peggy probably was not the first patient. The first patient was a kid that we thought had scarlatina, but we. Uh, that had persisting fever and was sicker than he should have been and didn't respond to penicillin. And, we, and his urine had multiple elements suggesting a uh, combination of thyroiditis uh, and urethritis and cystitis. Uh, and we found, and we sent his sample off for serology. And during this time, let's say it went on for about 18 months, uh, CDC got samples from here for kids that we suspected had leptospirosis once we figured it out, figured out what was happening. But they also were getting samples for kids with aseptic meningitis and other things. And they had more positives for leptospirosis from the St. Louis submissions than they had in the rest of the country. Uh, so the uh, So in Ames Place, which was the uh, sort of developed uh, uh, suburb right after the uh, World's Fair, uh, that uh, uh, so Ames Place, we have about I don't know fifteen blocks of residential homes. It used to be fairly upscale. Now they've sort of come down to where pediatricians can live there. The, uh, and uh, right in the shadow of the undergraduate campus of Washington University with a lot of professors. And the, uh, we did, uh, so we had, we started looking for it and we found that there were 18 patients in just that little part of St. Louis and the audience place. And, we figured out that she got her leptospirosis not from working in cane fields and getting cuts on her legs and having sylvatic rodents urinating on her legs, uh, the, uh, uh, or uh, some of the other occupational uh, source of uh, hazards that cause adult leptospirosis. One of which was so-called Fort Bragg fever, which the Marines back in the 1940s, you know, had shin splints, or at least their shins got swollen and red and tender. They had fever, and uh, 
they put all their serums away and took them out 15, 20 years later and found out they all had uh, leptospirosis. Um, so Fort Bragg fever became another form of leptospirosis. At any rate, we did. Um, so she had, uh, Peggy uh, had uh, gerbils and uh, thin the dog. She was she sick with the dog. And, uh, something we found out as the investigation went on is that the dogs are immunized by law to leptospirosis. So the dogs are not sick, but they did have leptospirosis in their urine when we catheterized them and looked for it. So we had immunized dogs carrying where they would get it would be the rats who live in the sewer system, Norwegian, Norwegian rats, I guess. Now. And uh, so uh, <laughs> the, uh, when we figured this out, uh, that her dog uh, was carrying it to her, and also to her gerbil, probably since the gerbil had left those viruses too. The uh, so we went to City Hall, which you know what the City Hall looks like with the searchlight up on the roof, and the, went to the uh, health board uh, meeting and uh, told them that you know this was a little epidemic of leptospirosis, and we, that they needed to get rid of the rats, and they laughed and tittered and. Uh, because they said, well, if you get us a talk to the Atomic Energy Commission and get us a nuclear weapon, maybe we could get rid of the rats. The, uh, but otherwise, we can poison a few of them, but that doesn't usually make much difference. And uh, you want us to poison some of them? No, that's all right. So the intervention that was effective in aborting the uh, outbreak was what? We got rid of all the garbage cans uh, in the alleys that were being knocked over by the dogs and uh, enticing the rats to come out from the uh, storm sewers. We have a single, we have a solitary sewer system in most of St. Louis, which would cost billions to replace, uh, in which the storm water is responsible for uh, cleaning the sanitary sewers. Uh, down to our water treatment plants, or occasionally when it rains a lot, right into the Mississippi River. The uh, what? Uh, so we uh, got rid of all the garbage cans and uh, put dumpsters in all the alleys uh, with the tops that uh, uh, have strong springs on them, and they're kind of high. So um, we no longer. So we broke the link. Oh, we. Pulled the uh, manhole off the corner of our street, and Peggy lives. Peggy lived in the block beyond us. We're 6900, and she was 6700. There's no 6800 in our part of you know, Waterman. And they, uh, what? Uh, so we pulled it, and we got a, a rat expert from Washington's undergraduate department. Uh, I forgot what they call him. The uh, and we dropped traps down and we caught a dozen rats in the morning. And uh, they all had leptospirae. One of them had either four or seven, I can't remember anymore. Cerebars, uh, so leptospirosis doesn't seem to be much of a problem for rats. Uh, but it's ubiquitous as far as we could tell. And, uh, so you really had to try to keep the rats interested in the sanitary sewers. But the, but the combination of the two means that if you have an old city and the storm drain, the storm sewers at the corner of the block have the mortars broken down, and the rats will move from the sanitary uh, sewers into the storm sewers and then out through the storm vents. But if you don't have food on the surface, they don't come up on the surface very much, they stay down there. And that was the way we uh, aborted the outbreak here. Uh, we still occasionally see a leptospirosis patient to remind us that it's there, 
like a lot of things that we forget are right on the edge of our existence, um, sort of like rickets, um, where if you stop giving vitamin D to little babies, you'll start seeing rickets. And I think the, uh, yeah, the doctors tend to forget, forget about it. We've had two scurvy cases this year. Um, but they were both just, you know, mothers who never got the kid on solids and continued to give uh, noodles uh, to their kid as their major source of uh, intake with no vitamin C. So the, the leptospirosis outbreak ended up in one very good paper, which I think Ralph is the first author. You know, or maybe Donnie Anderson, I can't remember. My name wasn't attached to that, uh, but I did enjoy the investigation. And the the uh, and use it for teaching periodically. You were on the Acapulco School Societies paper, which is I was on the one. You are the uh, main author on the Acapulco School Societies paper with Turnbull, oh, oh, which, right. is, which right. is more relevant for the gastroenterology. Yes, right. Uh, right. And off quoted in all of my chapters. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. Yes, I think it, I, you're right. I think the uh, yeah we had a little. Uh, the main calculus cholecystitis thing is kind of you know interesting too because I think uh, we don't have a big burn we have a good burn service in terms of uh, relatively small burns but that would be uh, without a big burn unit you're not going to see as much a calculus cholecystitis uh, the, uh, and uh, we don't have that uh, here very much but the uh, yeah those are kind of fun those are fun topics old topics. <laughs> Yeah, you know, because the leptospirae is one of those things. It's commonly misunderstood that if you if you're jaundiced from leptospirosis, you're you're likely more likely to die than if you're not jaundiced. Uh, so that if it's listed as a cause of liver failure, well, it doesn't cause liver failure. Uh, so that the jaundice, which is due to an inflammatory process in the liver, from the leptospirae, but the you know even the autopsy cases, which we've had. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, don't show liver necrosis, or uh, and they a gastroenterologist wouldn't call them liver failure. You know, they call them cholestasis in the setting of systemic sepsis and something like that. But the uh, but a lot of people on the media they read the leptospirosis literature. You know, notice that if they're, they're jaundiced, they're more likely to die, and they assume that means they're going to die of liver failure, which is not true. Uh, they die of diffuse vasculitis, edema, multiple organ failure, adult pulmonary, uh, uh, what do we call it? Adult pulmonary edema. Uh, and, you know, tissue loss and secondary invasion and kidney failure is actually, they do sometimes have, but the, uh, but, you know, when it's a rare condition, they're jaundiced, the assumption. Sort of like Rye syndrome, you know, a lot of people uh, don't know that that's not liver failure uh, because they have elevated very high transaminases in some of the patients. And they're encephalopathic and they go through the same uh, process as uh, someone with hepatic encephalopathy in terms of uh, confusion and agitation and vomiting. And that, uh, so there's an agitated delirium and then there's posturing. Um, but they, uh, they don't have liver failure. The liver recovers completely. Uh, if they recover, they, uh, you know, it's, uh, a week later, it's normal. Um, it's not the kind of slow recovery you might get from a you know, submassive necrosis from a viral hepatitis. Uh, they, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, you did pick up some interesting uh, things. The, uh, so, yeah, leptospirae is fun. Uh, we've had a couple of cases this year. I don't know, St. Louis might have more of it. I have a feeling we just have, we're more likely to do the serologies and uh, look for it. Because if you do a liver biopsy, you're not going to find it. Uh, you just, uh, well, you could if you did silver stains and you knew exactly what you're looking for. But when people see leptospirae, they tend to think of them as unimportant. Uh, you know, mouth organisms and things like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good. That's a really, really good story. And the, and the nice thing about the paper is that, that everything that's 
important about the cases in the paper. Uh, if you want to expand it beyond that, like Ralph did. Uh, so <laughs> he and Donnie, you know, scoured the world for uh, references that had to do with Leptospirae and put together. I can't remember what it's in. Some kind of a review journal, but talk about encyclopedic. I mean, it's really Ralph at his best uh, and has every goddamn thing uh, that's ever been, you know, the Titus Media and, uh, you know, uh, conjunctivitis sort of thing. They, uh, what 